Hello, Hello Clark. Clark. We're live. How you going, buddy? We're doing the thing. We're doing it. Do, All right. Doing the thing. Somehow he's nervous, but uh, yeah, this guy is um, yeah, very cool. Um, Clark is a nutritionist, um, biohacker, whatever that means. We'll talk about that um, <laughs> soon to be. He's, he's not a doctor, but uh, in May he is actually a doctor after finishing medicine and so wants to be a doctor. doctor in like three months and then we can... Three, three months, nearly a doctor and yeah. uh, in the future an endocrinologist. And um, Clark popped up in data-driven fasting and, um, yeah, it was a real help jumped into all the lives and had a whole lot of amazing insights and um, became a really good friend and shared a lot of info. And we were back and forward on um, Facebook Messenger, just chatting, nerding out. He's drowning me with papers and I thought, why not get him on to have a chat um, with all the insights, all the all the questions people have. Clark has actually got the knowledge and research understanding from both a medical and a personal um, experimentation perspective to understand how it all works. So yeah, welcome, Clark. Uh, Clark, great to great to chat, man. Thanks for. Yeah. I was like, hey, on. I like what's going on here. I should just join the community and derail everything and <laughs> <laughs> confuse us with, with that. papers on fructose yeah. metabolism or something awful. I don't know. <laughs> so. With facts and research. So um, yeah, yeah. So t tell us about Clark. How did he get to be a, a you know you're a nutritionist and then decided to do medicine you've done a whole lot of biohacking nerdy stuff to try and hack your body and you know you you were going on do you want to have rob wolf on the chat too uh, i don't yeah. think i'll be enough and you, you chat to rob all the time and um yeah. rob, rob might come later but um yeah you're uh you're, you're quite a background how'd you how'd you get to be clark not clark kent but clark it, connery it all sounds cooler than it is that's like the theme <laughs> like i don't know i don't like Maybe I should take more pride in a lot of it, but I don't know. I, you know, I think a lot of people, I was the dietitian who was like a fat kid growing up, right? And then, you know, you hit with like sixth grade, pretty fat. And then you had that point where you're like, why am I fat? And then you start getting curious, right? And that's basically the gist of how this all started. Um, but no, fast forward, um, I'll try to give the, the, the uh, elevator pitch of my life real quick. So, um, Lost some weight in high school, got into bodybuilding, powerlifting in high school, but then I kind of didn't, had a lot of gut issues and kind of hurt my back with powerlifting. Um, decided to just like completely leave that, went like vegetarian, vegan, like early college, and then switched to like jujitsu and body weight training stuff, and then still had gut issues. Um, and then uh, I, around 2008, I think, um, you know, I was kind of on the CrossFit message boards and Someone linked to this place called Catalyst Athletics Message Boards, which some a few people might know what that is. And uh, go over there. There's a few, you know, a few dozen souls over there. Wild Wolf happened to be one person on there, and so we were just a weird crew. It was Greg Everett, the Olympic lifters. You, you were actually one of the original six uh, listeners, were you? Of yeah, Wolf. kind of around that realm. Yeah, <laughs> because you yeah. Me and yeah. yeah. So got in there and uh, it was funny. I was like vegetarian. And then I think I read all the paleo and I have stuff. And I don't know. I'm The weirdest thing about me is if something makes sense to me, I feel like I can dramatically change my entire life. That like, And so I remember just reading all this stuff. And then like in, within three days, I was like, yeah, this sounds right. Like it just logically made too much sense. And I was like, yeah, they're right. All right, yeah. I'm just going to change my entire life. So, so. <laughs> Rob Wolf made me do it. Yeah. That's my excuse too. Yeah. I, yeah. That was my first stint playing with like fasting and keto and everything. And then I was the exact stereotype. And I think this is a funny thing with these communities is like, you know, you see this stuff with fasting and you're like, this would be great for the metabolically deranged population, right? And yet yeah. everyone who tried it first was these like, People working out three times a day, like, like <laughs> you know, in the morning I would jump rope for a half hour, then lift middle of the day, and then at night do jujitsu. And it's like when you're 21, you can do you. I don't know, you could just do amazing stuff like that that would kill me now. But um, so I actually got a little disheartened with it because I think I just destroyed myself too much, and it really was just overtraining. But mm. so, but that was my first stint with a lot of keto and paleo and IF stuff, and I actually moved away from it for a couple of years um, and got my dietitian's license. I was always curious about it, but I was kind of like waiting to redo it. Um, I was just trying to get in my head like, hey, I need to not like push so hard and, you know, myself with training. 
And so once I was kind of ready, I came back and I kind of had to, because I was having so many gut issues. Um, I had to leave work uh, one time. Wow. So, yeah, something happened. Then I, uh, it's actually really, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story, <laughs> but, but um, I, uh, yeah, basically I just like lost, was like having like frequent like bowel control issues. And I basically had to, wow. was, yeah, commuting like two hours to work every day and had a, like a mess. And then literally had to drive home two hours just, <laughs> in my own, like sitting in my own filth like all right and remember the two went, hours gotta, gotta work out what's going on here this yeah is it's it was the most, not like, working yeah it was the most life-changing drive and i remember like <laughs> on the drive i was thinking all right we're gonna go back and i've been putting all the paleo and keto stuff on hold but i'm just like there's nothing like sitting in like your own like just i'll try to be like <laughs> you're like i need to change something so uh came back and kind of returned and it was like okay I do believe in this stuff, but I know I did it wrong before. And now we're going to like go through this methodically. And one of the problems I made at the beginning was I changed everything at the same time. And I All do believe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Common mistake. Everybody jumps in and gets, oh, I need to change. You're going to change everything all at once. And it's like, no, yeah. no, no, no. I suppose I found the same thing. It's like, love the data, love the numbers, love all the analysis. But even my brain blows up when you try to do everything all at once so um, yeah so how'd you go how'd you go from there to being you know uh deciding to do medicine and and you, you mentioned you're moving on to endocrinology and and that fascinates you completely yeah 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 actually a good segue sorry i'll talk to her about diet crap but um basically yeah i was um realized you know that at that time i was doing home care that two-hour commute and then um you know i'd done inpatient nutrition doing like you know enteral feedings and whatnot and working in the head and neck clinic and uh just doing different various Wow. there and I did home care and how I got to where I want to be, which is outpatient work. So I was basically working with regular people trying to do dietetic or diabetic interventions and whatnot. So I was at a VA in uh, Ohio and um, the VA, it's, it's very slow to change, right? Oh, mm. yeah, but you're in Australia. So you probably don't know this. So it's like a yeah. government. Um, are you aware? I don't know. Yeah. Veterans uh, administration is it or? Yeah, yeah. So they have like, I was trying to make some big changes in this sort of space with sort of lower carbon interventions and whatnot. But, you know, it was tricky because it was kind of easier with my overweight patients, but the diabetic ones, it was tricky because I would try to get, I would try to help them towards these changes. Mm. They would improve their blood sugars, but then they had this issue of approaching, you know, getting lower and lower and having potentially hyperglycemic events. Like I was trying to keep mm. them away from it, but we needed to reduce their medications. Now, the VA is very old school in terms of which insulins they would give. And this is back around like, you know, 2010 through 2015. And they're also on sulfonylurea, so like glenamide, mm. glyburide. So, and for people who don't know, these are insulin secreting agents. In other words, they tell your pancreas to release more insulin. Yeah. But they also have true risk for hypoglycemia. Yeah. So it'll stimulate your pancreas to drive out more insulin than it usually would. Yeah. I mean, your wife is type one, correct? Yeah, type one. So she's got a closed loop pump system that pumps out insulin all the time. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're well versed in all this, and you know, yeah. so Com- you just, you know. completely nerd out with all the data. And I suppose that's why I, I caution people not to, you know, because because setting up the closed loop insulin pump system is completely fascinating, but completely scary as to, when you, you you you've got the wife's literally the life in, in in your own hands as you're trying to tweak all the numbers and make it all work and yeah all those little uh, variations day to day and moment to moment blow people's yeah. brain up and, you know i wish i had gotten to work on more type ones at the ba only got to work with a few but so you know it, it definitely was a lot you know scarier at times you know um so i commend you on being able to kind of like help her manage that it's very mm-hmm. time intensive yeah um Working with the type twos, I I got a few guys off of insulin, but it was always this tricky process where, you know, I I wasn't allowed to tell them to change their meds. I just kind of would like, you know, just talk mostly diet. But these were often smarter guys who kind of could put one and one together and like be like, uh, I kind of see what's going on here. Mm. And you know, one of the funniest was I had one guy who uh, somehow he got into one of my weight loss classes, and he um he was diabetic, but he shouldn't have. This is just a general overweight one, but he. Somehow he was on 80 units of insulin a day. Wow. And then I was talking to him one day. He was always a quiet guy in the back. And he was like, yeah, I've been off all my insulin for a few weeks now. And I was like, you were on insulin? <laughs> I was like, all right. 
you weren't supposed to be in this class. And I'm like freaking out because now I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble. But I'm like, oh. <laughs> isn't that the ridiculousness of it, right? That I got to go have insulin and now I'm like worried I'm going to get in trouble. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you broke it. <laughs> yeah. So that same time, you know, I'm reading this research on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1s and you know, basically these kind of cool new diabetic drugs that are able to uh, actually, you know, make people live longer, right? Because, you know, giving a type 2 diabetic insulin or sulfonylureas does prevent, you know, acute events that would put them in ER, but it doesn't really make them live longer. You know, and mm. you can go into the mechanisms and it's most likely, probably a combination, but the most likely is effective insulin essentially increasing, um, you know, cardiovascular events, the effects on the mm. arteries and whatnot. So, yeah, and with type 1s, just trying to control the sugars by jamming in more and more insulin to try and get lower blood sugars just basically stops the fat loss and you're, uh, you're building up all the bad things in your body, including a lot of excess fat. Yeah, yeah. So I was looking at these new drugs and I was really kind of excited because, you know, not only did they actually improve lifespan for diabetics, but you didn't really have the same risk of lows. I mean, it is possible to get a low on these drugs, but typically not. Like GLP ones mm. typically only do their activity when you eat. So mm. If you haven't eaten, there's not really the same kind okay. of and, and then SGLT twos and then metformin, like that seems to be this like, you know, this combo, right? I was just sitting mm. there like, wow, like I wish I could put people how to ship these guys, like talk to someone and I wish I could to a patient decide if i felt like he was willing to do this say, hey can we like shift them off these off insulin or an insulin secretagogue and put them on maybe this combo and then i can just have him hammer some fasting and whatnot and now we're not worried about lows as much and that sounds cool right <laughs> so what's the combo take them off the injected exogenous insulin and put them on the sulfonylureas no, no no you don't want to put them on a avoid the sulfonylurea because that would still potentially cause lows right yep by switching them to a GLP-1 and SGLT-2 inhibitor. Yep. Um, I can explain these. Should I explain these drugs? I don't know. Yeah, well, why not just for people who aren't okay. aware so, of the details? Yeah. So the three – so metformin I think a lot of people are aware of, and I won't try to explain the mechanism of metformin because I don't think anyone really fully knows. There's debates <sighs> on whether it inhibits complex one in the electron transport chain or whatnot, and, you know, is it exercising a pill? It seems like it's somehow, like – almost hurts the mitochondria and as a result yeah. they kind of like rebuild you know but these are debates and i've even heard that that might not be it and so yeah. we'll just we'll, we'll, it does something good we just know that <laughs> <laughs> for some people yeah it is sort of a dose it, it depends on the patient in other words um the more metabolically deranged a patient is the more benefit they get from it if you're closer to healthy you actually don't get as much benefit from it for me. yeah so it's an interesting quirk of it and it seems potentially it inhibits exercise adaptions and inflammation the like and yeah yeah i was actually yeah. just reading a study today though where they actually gave metformin to athletes and it was an ergogenic aid in other words it increased their performance and i was like i don't understand that so <laughs> <laughs> i was digging into it because i was like it's i'm like how are you inhibiting the mitochondria and making them better i don't know but whatever <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's one of those things that's one reason I, I get hesitant to even say things and like get you know don't always come out because I feel like I'll read a study a year later and I'm like well that just proved what I thought so I'm just gonna hide in the back and not talk so yeah <laughs> but I guess so we'll talk about the other two drugs so GLP one uh incretin one this is like a Zempic and you know uh, Trulicity um, these are these injectables that essentially mimic um, this sort of hormone released by the pancreas that, um, it, you know, it penetrates insulin. In other words, it helps your own insulin uh, work better, um, mm. increases satiety of the gut. In other words, like you, um, you'll be more, you'll, you, I mean, satiety, right? That's the name of the game. Mm. With a lot mm. of hydration, right? But, Which we'll talk about later. Yeah. Exactly, right? So you guys just said a gut level, but a brain level too. GLP-1 actually penetrates into the brain and increases satiety at the brain. Um Funny enough, the main side effects are intense nausea, right? Like, wow. That's kind of what it's supposed to do, right? Like <laughs> satiety through wanting to throw up. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I won't go into all the effects of uh, all the effects of it. You know, we are seeing improved cardiac outcomes from it as well. And then SGLT2 inhibitors are kind of interesting. So it's since it SGLT2, sodium glucose transported 2. This is this co-transporter in the kidney that basically 
your kidney filters out glucose and then sucks it back up. Yeah. And it can only do that a certain amount. And that's why once it passes a certain number, people urinate out sugar with diabetes because your kidney can only reabsorb a certain amount. Right. Yeah. And it's through this sodium glucose transporter. It uses the two together, sodium and a glucose to pull back in. This drug blocks that. So basically you cause people to pee out sugar at a much lower level, which initially sounds bad. It sounds like you're going to get every urinary tract infection in the world, you know, because you got like a Margaritaville party going on in your crotch. But it turns <laughs> out, yeah, like it doesn't do that. Like you do see some yeast infections, but typically if people just keep better hygiene down there, you don't yep. see you don't see the okay. infections. And again, these are showing cardiac benefits. What's interesting is these cardiac benefits are regardless of the blood sugar drop. In other words, if mm. even if someone has a minimal blood sugar decrease, you actually still see um, your cardiac benefits. So yep. but I was curious, not just because of all that, but also, hey, these things don't really cause lows very often. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so if you want to take a patient on insulin and try some of this fasting stuff, you know, you could do it with like a thousand patients. And if, you know, potentially if one has a hypoglycemic episode, you might get sued, right? Yeah. That kind of sucks. So I think one of the questions we had later is what do you want to see change in nutrition? <laughs> this is like, this is part of it. Like I was sitting there just like beating my head against a wall and I felt like I really wanted to do this stuff with the VA. Now keep in mind, I talked about the VA with its old drugs, but basically like it's going to be forever for the VA to even start using these drugs. They keep like a mm, formula. Wow. In other words, they're still using a lot of old drugs. That, and some of them are fine, but sometimes it's like, you're not, it's, I was like, it's going to be 20 years before I could get a patient on one of these here. Mm. And at what point do people qualify to be on those uh, alternative drugs? You know, it depends on insurance and whatnot. But again, the VA is, is, has to cut costs a lot. And a lot of these drugs aren't generic yet. And so if it's not generic, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in insurance and pharmacy and everything, but basically those are the issues that these, a lot of them are not generic still. And so the VA is not it's very hard to get them covered. And, you know, so that was one piece of it. Mm. Um, I talk way too much. I'll let you cut it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, so how did you, and then from there you've, um, you've decided to go from being a nutritionist to say, let's do medicine and uh, you're about to finish medicine, finishing, finishing up your residency yeah. and then long-term as a endocrinologist. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah, let's kind of jump ahead real quick. So basically um, I started getting in some arguments with my, with my managers at work because I was trying to do these different things and it wasn't even regarding the insulin. It was literally just the diet education. I was doing things differently and you started to get in arguments I ended up printing off the VA DOD guidelines, which is basically like their actual document on like what we can teach nutritionally. And I went through and looked, I printed off every work cited or every reference. And I proved that I could do what I was doing. And then actually going through it, I showed her too. I was like, and by the way, I actually miscited things. This is like a government document for the VA, the, the largest medical system in the world, I believe. And like, this is actually cited incorrectly. There are multiple times they cite certain studies for things and the data is not in there. I think they meant to cite this study. So actually, I was like, side note, this is a dog shit article, <laughs> but that's beside the point. So. <laughs> you, you weren't very popular at the VA. They didn't uh, promote you to see you like, immediately. I feel like spite is the like biggest impetus to get something done. Sometimes like, it is. Anger is a great motivator. Yeah, you're like, all right, I'm going to prove them wrong. We got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go do medicine? Yeah. yeah so cool. I had... So I was like, okay, I'm going to move out of Ohio and I ended up moving to Vegas. That's a long story. I ended up going to med school here and now I'm finishing up and I'm kind of, I'm as of in what, like, like five days, I have to submit my residency match list, which is if people know what that is, uh, yikes. And then I have to decide where <laughs> I'm going to end up and then hopefully be able to land an endocrine fellowship after that. And yeah, here we are. Uh, nice. Yeah, cool. And it's really great to have you part of the community and uh, sharing all your insights and uh, helping people in data driven fasting. So, just quickly, you've um, obviously done a few different biohacks on yourself and tried to <laughs> try a whole bunch of weird and wacky stuff since you were twenty one and, and, and a and a vegan powerlifter. Um, what have you tried that worked and what didn't? And you know, then we'll segue to your data driven fasting journey. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts on this. First off, like, I don't know, the term biohack is always like, yeah, and it's, me too. And it's, 
I'll say it in a couple ways. Number one, some people will like fast and say, oh, I'm biohacking. And I'm like, there's people in the world starving. They're not biohacking. <laughs> cool like, biohacking. Yeah. <laughs> so I say sometimes I feel like people are just doing stuff you're supposed to do. Like occasionally like, they don't eat. And I'm like, yeah, that's not hacking. Like, I don't know. I don't want to go down rabbit holes, but I don't know. I feel like there are like a lot of true pharmaceuticals, I would say, like are real. I don't know. I feel like vaccines are the biggest hack in the world, but I don't want to like, I don't know, drop a crazy. Yeah, so whatever. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so no, I've tried a lot of weird things. Like, for example, I've tried a lot of nootropics, you know. And again, I don't call it, consider them hacking. And nootropics, people don't know, these are essentially things that are supposed to, we'll just say, make you like, you know, think better or perform better mentally and whatnot. Um, there's like this actual definition for them. And the funny thing is the actual definition says that it should not really cause any like withdrawal or basically any problem in the body. And I didn't experience that. Like I would say everything I've played with over time, I think has pros and cons. And my opinion on a lot of stuff is I'm not like necessarily for or against a lot of things in life. I feel like most things are tools and so you mm. play with them and you just learn, okay, like, this is the time to use it and this is not the time to use it. Um, later on, we can talk about exercise and I feel like that's persistently the exercise issue is people are constantly doing something, but they don't know why. I'm like, why are you doing, you know, like almost any type of workout can be good in the right scenario for the right goal. And it's just mm. understanding when to use this and when to use that. And that's what people mess up all the time. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I've tried like, you know, who else watching this? I don't know. <laughs> so, Confessions of yeah. weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've tried a lot of new traffic. I believe if we can go more in depth if you want. <laughs> um, no, that, 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 that's cool. So um, to, to segue to, to, to data driven fasting, you, um, you, you, you popped up on, um, on, on the end of the yeah, chunky boy. <laughs> da, data driven fasting. You, you just sent me this one and then you, you shot me this one and I went, Oh wow. Who's this guy? And I didn't know he was uh, doing this. So, um, at the start of the DDF challenge, you went from um, 193 to 181 yeah. pounds and obviously pretty damn shredded. So um, yeah. how did you find the experience and uh, what was unique from this to all the different things you tried in terms of bodybuilding and weight loss and IF? Yeah. Well, let me send you one more that will actually be interesting to talk about because when you go back to the chunky one, that was sort of a po um, – I used to be keto for a long time. Um, and actually I was kind of like what's known as like a keto guy. Uh, all right, I'll just send you this one. I have like another one. No, I'll send, I, I should have sent this ahead of time. All right. So I was keto for a few years and this was just one example picture. I wish I had gotten this other one ready for you. So that was like during my keto days. Um, and I have one where I was leaner, uh, but it was like decent muscle mass at the time. And keto worked for me for a long time. And then um, I was training a lot, taking in somewhere between, I was at, I think I was maintaining weight somewhere between 3,600 to 4,000 calories a day. Um, I had to take 5,600 in one day. That was like a peak. Um, it's a lot of but, training. Yeah, so I was doing a lot. I was doing jiu-jitsu. I was rock climbing. I was doing tricking. If people know what that is, it's like gymnastics, tumbling, essentially. Um, so having a blast. Then something flipped in my – I've been doing well in keto for a while. And then I still don't exactly know what happened. Um, my I started getting these gallbladder issues. And, hmm. um, yeah, it was very odd. So during the first year of med school, and I don't know if it was just a combination of the stress of med school, I actually got divorced at the same time right when med school started, which is a whole discussion, um, and sort of having all these gallbladder issues. I got a HIDA scan, which is essentially a gallbladder scan, and it was having a reduced ejection, and I didn't have any gallstones, but, you know, it was just this weird issue where it was almost like I was lacking bile, um, potentially want to take my gallbladder out. I did. If you want to talk about biohacks, I've done a lot of random stuff. Like I actually was supplementing bile and taurine. Taurine is actually like yep. a key thing for actually bile production. If you go into the rabbit hole with that. Um, and then it's taking like Ursa decolic acid or, or, or Ursa, Ursa diol. I can't ever pronounce it right, but Ursa deoxycholic acid. 
uh, which helps with bile. But um, eventually it was just kind of falling apart. I got an endoscopy and I had this wicked ulcer in my duodenum, which made me think I had like a like an H. pylori infection, but I didn't. And then it, it started to hit this weird point. And I don't, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what went wrong, but the only consistency is it seems like everything I ate at that time, if I try to eat it now, it re my gallbladder. Wow. And it's like, I've been picking this apart for a long time because I really enjoyed keto and it worked incredibly well for me for a long time. Um, but something flipped and I don't know if, I don't know, if I want to get like a hippie, if I want to act like a hippie or something, I'd be like, I don't know, maybe the stress of the time I created some yeah. sort of like allergic rejection of everything I did at the wow. time. I don't know. It would be like my hippie response, but that doesn't make sense to me. So I don't know. So, so then you got to, to this and then, yeah. and we've got so like, the, the, the DDF period. Yeah. So go to the, you go to the chunky boy one. Chunky, so, boy. Yeah. chunky clock. Yeah, so the, the thick picture from before, the one where I was like a muscular, was probably a body weight about 180. Um, and then this is like 200, either 200 or 200.2 200 or 202 or something. I kept trying to brute force back. And then this was actually right when COVID started. And um, my girlfriend got diagnosed with a really bad medical issue and just a lot of stress. But I kept trying to brute force back into keto. And then I'm always that guy who's just going to flip my life. But finally, I was like, screw it. This isn't working. I'm going to just completely change it. So... I was like, all right, let's come back to just brute force fasting. Um, and I'm actually going to go low fat, high carb because screw it. Let's do something different. You know, I just won't go for it. But then go to the next picture. So I was studying for my oh. second. Yeah, this one. So I was studying for my second board exam and I was able to pull off about nine pounds. So going from the, 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 the fat picture from before to the one on the left right here, it's, you know, 193. And then I finished my second board exam and it was like, seeing your program and I read it and I was like, all right, this is all plausible. Let's do it. So give it a crack. Yeah. yeah. And side note, that's another thing, another pet peeve of mine that I I'll just go for something for a few weeks. And I feel like more people should try this, like just do it with tea and then see if it, and then start asking yeah. more questions. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that people like to ask questions in the beginning, but sometimes people ask a lot of questions and I can eventually tell like they're at that point. I'm like, you need to try this for one or two weeks and yeah, come yeah. back. Because you're not actually asking the right questions yet. Yeah. So, uh, and and in data driven fasting, we find that people come up with all these questions. They're confused by all the data. It's like just do it, yeah. follow the program, and we've got the whole thing structured so that as the as people generally go, oh, what about this? And the daily post or the FAQ will pop up and tell them, and we can answer it rather than having to know everything. Because you know, trying to stand, understand everything about what affects your blood sugars and how to manage it and rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Before you actually do anything, there's just complete paralysis by analysis and nobody do actually does anything. Yeah. There's, um, I think Rob Wolf was talking about this recently where he used to be very like, like results oriented as opposed to, as opposed to process oriented. And he's talking about that in the context of jujitsu. And what that means is like, you know, let's say you're powerlifting, you're very focused on the numbers, hitting these PR goals. But jiu-jitsu is like this weird ephemeral, like you don't hit these numbers. It's just this process of basically like the recipe is just show up and get on the mats. Mm. Just, the only thing you could really measure is how much time did you spend on the mats? That's the only like measurable thing to say how you got better. And I think sometimes that's like, yeah, just jump in the water, man. It's warm. It's not so bad. Like, so just like, I think of that a lot. So I, I these I, all these I, other people have done it and it worked. Just follow them and, you know. So how did you find the process? Did, do you know the um, the calorie intake Michael asked? Do you know yeah. have any idea of what your calorie intake there was? Yeah, so I follow a little bit of like a, a zigzag approach, which is um, Dr. Squat, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Hatfield, he was the first guy yeah. to squat over a thousand pounds, but um, smart guy. But, you know, I kind of, it's basically just, I would modulate my calorie intake based on my activity a little bit. Mm. And also this was hand in hand with, um, you know, mixed feelings on John Kiefer from carb backloading back in the day. I think he had some things right and some things I don't like, but I don't know. I think he's a smart guy. And I, I mm. think that refeeding if done appropriately can have its benefits. So I would basically take my calories to the lowest was 1400. Um, you see a 13 to 1400 was the lowest I think I remember at the time. And I could maybe hold that for two days in a row. Mm -hmm. um, 
that would be, and if it was really low, then I would have to do a caloric surplus. And I was working out, I was kind of busy. So I was working out once every three days and then two days in between, but even just studying or walking basically. Um, um, so yeah. So then for the caloric surpluses, I think it was, so maybe, so on the very low end, it was about 1400, but on average, my lower caloric days were about 1700. Mm. Then I would switch and do one day that was a little bit higher and try to coincide that with my workout day. And I think it was on average about 20, 26 to 2,800 calories. And this is while you're doing data driven fasting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And my, my carbohydrate, I was actually doing at the time, I would try to do keto some days because I still to this day try to brute force see if I can do keto. <laughs> but my, my gallbladder always, we nick my girlfriend forced me to name my gallbladder because he's so annoying. His name's Henry. <laughs> So it's from a joke, but basically we're like, Henry's acting up. <laughs> so I have been doing like a high carb version, but you know, I love the stuff you showed, the graph, the carbohydrate density graph. And that's become one of my favorite things where it's, you know, in association with almost the um, Irritia, very Taub study, the diet fit study. And it hmm. is argument that I prefer people, I'm like the non-keto keto guy. I try to push people more towards low carb. I'm like, but you can make higher carb work. It can be done. Um, so, yeah, I was doing a little bit of a higher. I still do a bit of a higher carb approach, and um, my protein intake was typically 180 to 220 grams most day. So, yeah. Yeah. So, how did you find data driven fasting that was different from what you tried before? The biggest thing I really loved was actually the feeling the hunger, which is something. I think a lot of times my perception was that hunger was more mental and a lot of times it, it sounds odd, but it was more abdominal. Like mm. I would feel crappy sometimes and feel off. And I was like, Oh, maybe I'm hungry. I would check my blood yeah. sugar and I'm like, Oh, that's yeah. not low at all. So <laughs> then it became pretty persistent that, yeah, it was the very classic, like when you're a kid, the tummy rumbling, like old school stuff you would think of. Yeah. would correlate with a dip in blood sugar. Um, yeah. And it was weird too. I could tell there was this weird phenomenon I'd have where my abs started almost involuntarily contracting. I'd be at work and I would just be like randomly getting these like contractions in my stomach. I haven't really talked about this, but I was like, I got curious and I started checking and normally that coincided with like a big dip in blood sugar. Um it almost felt like it was like squeezing the fat out of itself. If I want to <laughs> give a worshiping hippie thing, I don't know, whatever. But like, yeah, that's how it felt. But yeah, I mean, look at my blood sugar and it's fine. But a side note, I'm wearing a CGM right now, so we can talk oh, about cool. that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's really important to get that correlation between your actual sensations of hunger because I think, you know, everybody wants to do fasting, but that a lot of the time fasting is for days on end and it's just push through hunger, ignore hunger, you know grit your teeth and bear it and ignore the hunger. And then when people go to refeed, they're going over and it and they just binge and lose it and uh, just keep on making that no progress and uh, potentially worsen because they're not eating well when they're doing that refeed binge. And you know the biggest detail I always say to people now, like even I was talking to a patient today because, you know, I it's tricky because I'm working in other people's clinics, right? And I'm students, so I have to be careful about overstepping my bounds and working within my preceptor's uh, position. But this endocrinologist was awesome and he gave me a little leeway. But, you know, I was talking to a patient today and, you know, the biggest thing I tell people too, if they have played with fasting and we want to go into it, is just when you break your fast about prioritizing protein. And for me, for some reason, that seems to be mm. the most consistently missed point. Mm. And I feel like I cannot let anyone leave without that statement. I'm like, if you want to pay, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. And I, and I'm like, I cannot, if you're going to play with fasting, I cannot let you leave without this statement. And I'm like, yeah. make sure I look them in the eye. I'm like, when you break your fast, <laughs> you have to prioritize protein. And I yeah. calculate their protein needs. And I'm like, you need at least hit at least 50%, hopefully yeah. at least 75% of this, maybe all of it. You got to hit it. Like <laughs> no, no donuts, no cheesecake, no cookies, yeah. protein first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. Simple but um, effective. It's a simple Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's so simple yet so effective. And that's why I can't let people leave without it. Because I'm like, you have to hear this. Like Yeah. And then if they, they don't refill on 
energy from fat and carbs, the blood sugars are back down below their trigger again sooner rather than just filling up on this, you know, pasta and cheesecake and whatever that'll just keep your blood sugars and insulin just elevated forever. Yeah. Um, so one thing that comes up a lot is uh, exercise and blood sugars. And I know you've, you know, worked a lot to quantify that with your data-driven fasting journey and you actually do a lot of pretty hardcore exercise and notice different things and record it and quantify it and, you know, buy a hack it if you want to call that. Um, <laughs> What what would you advise people like? Because th there's definitely a a rise in blood sugars after people exercise, and then they test and go, oh, okay, can I eat? What does that mean? I mean, generally we just say, you know, don't try and eat your main meal around um, your workout, and then you know, just later on the day you use your blood sugar to guide your eating if you need to. But if you do a lot of really really intense exercise that may be elevated for longer how, how do you how do you manage that yourself with the ddf process yeah so it's funny because i always like get hesitant to but i'm always hesitant to recommend things until i've tried everything so i'll kind of talk about most things i've tried and there's a couple of things i haven't tried but i'll go ahead and talk about now because i think maybe someone else can try them but um a couple of things so um yeah where to start so I guess we'll just talk about exercise first, because I think there's this like odd question of like, what exercise should I do? So we'll just start there. Um, it's such a broad question, people are like, what exercise should I do? If you just talk about longevity, I don't know, that's debatable. If you look in the papers, the people who just play tennis with friends live the longest, but it's probably because of the community. <laughs> They live longer than people who run, and the people who run live longer than people who go to the health club, but the health club doesn't mean anything. It's, I don't know, like, is that what <laughs> They're probably drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always love the old 60s video where you have the guy on that piece of tape that just shakes his fat. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like let's bring what is that it, back. What? What is that doing? <laughs> I want that. I'm gonna put that in my gym. I, I think it just makes like, you feel makes you feel fat because your fat's jiggling. Oh, I need to eat first. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so, so anyways, um, you know, you get in these big debates and I typically, you know, obviously do what you enjoy, right? So like personally, I should be doing a little bit more of the zone two sort of mafetone cardio. And I'd like to talk about that for a minute. Mm, mm. I should be doing that more. Unfortunately, it can be boring as shit. So I, I just, <laughs> so I like, sorry if I, I don't know, language where we're at, but like, I don't know, I should, I'll reel it in. Sorry, I won't talk about it, but um, I, I'm perpetually like like to do the fun stuff. So I do a lot of handstands, used to do tricking on the flips and done jujitsu for years and lifting. So I don't know. I'm more like the like the let's let's do something that last ten seconds and then stop. So um mm. so with that said, you know, kind of comparing the two, I actually spent a little time reviewing this because I used to read a lot of this back in the day, like five years ago. So it was more fresh then. And then in med school I've just been, you know, inundated with phonology and all this other crap. So I try to review a little bit today, but um, my typical advice, you know, is it's like when I mentioned I worked out once every three days, part of that was on purpose because I kind of was trying to prove to myself, like, you can do most of this just with fasting. And then mm. um, I, once every three days, I would lift. And a couple things I just wanted to like say with lifting real quick. So, I mean, you can walk, get 8 million different lifting programs, but um, a couple things talking to people. Um, I think, you know, the main, when you compare working out, like, like resistance training versus cardio for weight loss, there's so many studies and it gets very confusing, but it does seem generally speaking that resistance training leads to more weight loss than cardio, which is weird. It seems odd, right? Yeah. You, know? you think you're burning more cal calories in, in the endurance going forever, cardio, yeah. And, but yeah. Yeah, it's like, and people ask why, because they're like, they're burning the calories. And, and you know, this comes up a, a lot on the on the forums here. And I feel like I don't always go into it because it's a lot to explain. So maybe we'll talk about it now. But people are like, well, I worked out a lot. Like, should I cut the calories off of, you know, should this increase my calorie window, right? Can I eat more? Mm. And it's like, we often kind of recommend people, ah, don't mess with it. Just keep doing your diet, yeah, yeah. you know. So let's kind of talk about that. So, um, so. I remember like reading this study in some tribal population where they were, you know, doing a ton of activity uh, tracking these animals, but you would see, and so, yeah, they're walking a ton, burning a lot of calories, but their thyroid would actually downregulate. Okay? Mm. And that makes sense, right? If you're in a scenario where you're tracking animals, low calorie, and you haven't eaten yet, you don't really want your metabolism to be eating away at you during that time. Yeah. So 
So the body has something built into it where if you're doing excessive amounts of exercise, your metabolism actually can adjust accordingly. And it just becomes more and more and more efficient, basically. So you're using less and less energy. Yeah, that seems like a good idea in nature, right? Like that just mm. makes sense, right? Like if you had to drive your car a long way, it'd be awesome if your car was like, okay, I know you're going a long way, so I'm going to use less gas and go for more distance. Like it would be, it would help us get to Mars and stuff, right? So, so you know, somewhere around the 45 minute mark, cortisol dramatically elevates in a lot of cardio efforts. Cortisol, uh, you know, impairs the conversion basically of thyroid becoming active. I think it's at the level of TSH going to T4, but I could be wrong. It could be T4 to T3. I actually need to review that. All right. And endocrinology uh, quality right there. But, but basically, cortisol, you know, has basically down regulates the effectiveness of thyroid. Why does cortisol increase so much um, during exercise? Like, is it just fuel liberation? It could be other issues. Like, cortisol does help you liberate, liberate fuels, but, you know, somewhere around the 45 minute mark, a lot of the, you know, the antioxidant buffers and whatnot in the heart get consumed. But now you need to, like, it could be related to that, like the effects on the heart. Maybe you just got to start protecting the heart. Maybe that's why we see AFib, you know, people who run too much. I don't know. We could go down a lot of rabbit holes, but basically, where I'm going is that, you know, excessive cardio at some point, there seems to be this detriment to metabolism. You mm. don't necessarily see this consistent weight loss from excessive cardio. Now, I'm using the word cardio, and the problem is, is not all cord- cardio is created equally. And we're going to come back to that. So, we talk about like zone two, math down stuff, and what cool. So, let's switch over back to resistance training, right? So, the cool thing about resistance training is, you know, we, we just see better hormonal optimization, right? Um, you know, if you're trying to get your testosterone and growth hormone higher, we, we can do this without the same cortisol spikes of lifting. And there might be, I might be a little wrong in some regards there. Like, there might, like, I need to review the, the, the level of cortisol spike during heavy resistance training, but generally speaking, some people who screw it up are taking not long enough rest breaks in the resistance training. You need, if you're training heavy, you need to take long rests or else you're really, people try to cut the rest shorter to burn more calories and then you just run into the issue we said before. You need to legitimately train your strength. So hmm. when we talk about optimizing this, let's, let's just get a little bit of numbers to help people out. So if we're trying to actually get increases in testosterone, hmm. real quick, it is men and women. A lot of women, you know, some people think that testosterone is just in men and estrogen is just in women, but obviously we know that's not true. Hmm. Testosterone predominates, even in women, yes, women have more estrogen than men, but if you look at like the neanogram concentrations, testosterone is still relatively high. Hmm. So we need to optimize these things. Um, and, and additionally, when you think of men and women, it's funny, men typically have more heart events. And actually, I would argue that maybe they should be doing some more macatone cardio. And then women, because the risks of osteoporosis, it might even be more important for them to lift. But the stereotype is the men are lifting and women are not. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, so with resistance training, um, I was kind of reviewing this recently, but uh, number one, you know, obviously compound movements. This is, most people know this, but if we don't know, like large compound movements that involve the lower body uh, really help with testosterone production. You're st- you know, that's why stereotypically some people base their programs on squatting and deadlifting. I don't really care mm. which one you do. I'm slightly more biased towards squatting, but it's really like, what do you like? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we got these, okay, cool. We've got like some heavy compound motions. Great. You know, and you're like, is it going to be a back squat? I mostly box squat, but it's like, can it be a front squat? I don't care. If it looks like a squat, it's probably a squat. Like, <laughs> so it's, it doesn't happens. really matter that much. Just do it. So the next thing is intensity. Intensity, people use this word, and some people think it's, oh, how hard does it feel? Intensity is just a measurement of uh, like of your one rep max. In other words, if you squatted, you know, 500 pounds, you know, 90% intensity is literally 90% of that weight. So that would be mm. what, 450, right? Mm. So 450 would be a 90% intensity. So, mm. and, I, and I know you probably know this, I'm just saying there's people who don't know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you go into the research, um, again, I might not be 100% of this. I was reading a review article on it recently, but even at like, God, what was it? I think it was 62%. I think up to 62% intensity. I'd be like, you know, uh, if you squatted 500 pounds, this would be like, I don't know, around 300-ish or so. At 62% intensity, 
even at doing a lot of sets and reps, you not necessarily see testosterone increases. Yeah. Um, you need basically some low threshold of intensity. And it's, it's, it's probably somewhere around 70 to 75% based on a lot of Soviet. When you look at Soviet papers and where they see the, the, the best, where they create the best athletes, it tends to be when they concentrate most of their reps around the 70 to 75% range. Right. And so, but, and if you, if you push yourself too, too high, you burn out. And like I find when I lift really heavy and push the body and go, this is fun until you completely crash and then I let yourself and you're, yeah. you're binging and, and lying in bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you pull a heavy single and then you go to bed at 7 p.m. for two weeks. And you're, <laughs> you're the nerves, you're I think Brent Contreras was talking about that once. He, he said that exactly. <laughs> Contreras is the glute guy. If you if you have butt problems, yeah, yeah. I'll give you some glutes. But um, anyways, uh, the other thing about heavy singles, though, this is contrary to what you think. But even if you pull, they did this, they did twenty reps of one rep maxes, and they did not see a testosterone increase. That's odd, right? So first, it's like a certain low threshold intensity, you don't see a testosterone increase. But then at too high, you don't. But here's the other piece. The other piece is volume. When you're mm. pulling singles, you have limited volume. And for people who don't mm. know what volume is, it's sort of a goofy calculation, but it's basically you take your sets times um, your reps times your, like, uh, I'm saying this way, your, your, your reps times your weight, and then you get this thing called volume, and you add that together. Mm. So let's say you did 10 reps with 10 pounds of something. You multiply 10 by 10, you get 100. And then you just, whatever that exercise is, you add up all your sets, and you get your volume for the, for the day. Hmm. What they found over time was that for biggest testosterone increases, it really became volume. In other words, you had to have a minimal intensity. And once you had a minimal intensity, somewhere probably around 70 to 75%, then it's about volume. And really, you have yeah. to increase the volume to get the testosterone gains. You didn't do enough volume without burning out, basically, yeah. sustainability again. Yeah. This is fascinating because this is the endocrine side, but it also seems to compare decently with like the Soviet research where they mm. just basically stuck. They found over time that if they just stuck around 70 to 75% intensity and just ramped up the volume, they didn't do yep. a bunch of singles, just ramped up the volume, they saw the, the biggest strength gain. And I, sorry, I'm saying I'm sort of equating testosterone to strength. We could talk yeah. about that. It's basically satellite cell recruitment and taking myonuclei and basically increasing yeah. the strength of a muscle without size, but whatever. But, and as you build strength, you build testosterone. Yeah. yeah. They're basically proportional. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's other hormones, there's growth hormone, there's lots of cool stuff, but I just wanted to like start off there. So what I'm saying is that resistance training, why did I just talk about all that? You need to take long rests, but really it's about, you need a, you need a heavy enough weight. And one of my problems with doing excessive amounts of hit, like the high intense, high intensity interval training, I feel like they're in this spot in the middle where they're not going super heavy mm. and they're also not really doing the, the most like long-term health cardio, the math of terms. Mm. What is it? Mm. So, mm. This has been sort of one of my philosophies for a long time, but I try to stay out of the middle. I try to do, I try to like play the, the opposite poles of a spectrum that I know I do that for a lot of things in life. And yeah. It kind of works yeah. Well. So you, you need neither either uh, either need to be strength building or building your your fat building uh, fat burning um, metabolic engine at the other end, which is basically walking and and running or whatever, where you can still breathe and yeah. have a conversation easily, and it's not stressful. So you're not in that gray zone where you're always out of breath a little bit, but not actually building strength at the other end. Yeah. Yeah. Ted talks about that a lot too, and yeah, it's fascinating to. Did he, uh, I did watch it. I saw you interviewed. I meant to watch that. <laughs> it's completely fascinating. The um, I heard a Peter Tier interview with um, uh, a guy who trains, does the lactate threshold testing on the Tour de France cyclists and just the, the fine tuning of that. But basically, they're just training them to burn fat at a low intensity all the time and then occasional sprint training to, to be able to burn glucose when they need to. But most important thing for them is to build the mitochondria to build fat, which is, you know, the fundamental aspect of metabolic health and that they can burn through a massive amount of carbohydrates. But um, the most important, important thing is for them to be able to build the mitochondria to build, burn fat at the lower end. Yeah. So we want to nerd out real quick for a second right there. Yeah, why not? All right. 
So let's talk about insulin resistance, right? So I've been trying to revisit this and in the past seen, okay, so we have this GLUT4 translocation, right? So we want to explain all, let's just do it. Okay. So um, insulin, so on your muscle and fat, you have this GLUT4 transporter. So it transports glucose into the cell and insulin helps bring it to the cell surface. Other parts of your body have glucose transporters that don't rely on insulin, but on the muscle and fat, they do, except with exercise. Mm. So there's this curious thing, right? And you, you, I mean, most of us are aware, but through exercise, we can actually bring this GLUT4 receptor to the cell surface and be able to get, you know, sugar into muscle or fat tissue without yeah. the need of insulin. That's yeah. cool, right? When I first learned about this, it was present. It seemed like initially it was very much presented as specifically to resistance training. No, or let, let me rephrase that: not resistance training, but glycogen depletion training. In other words, training in a way that depleted glycogen really stimulated this. So this could be a Wingate test, certain types of resistance training, basically heavy glycolytic training. But from what I'm reading now, it seems a little bit different. So. What happens in exercise is um, we have ATP, right? The energy molecule, and it's ready. And it has three phosphates, and they're all very electronegative. They don't like hanging out, so, you, so they want to pop off. And then you release a ton of energy when you do that, and that's how we create energy. And it's some chemistry and physics, if you want to have a blast there, right? So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. There's three phosphates, and then um, one pops off and becomes diphosphate. And your muscles are smart, right? If it quickly wants to get ATP back, it can actually take two adenosine diphosphates. So these both have two. So there's four phosphates there. And it just does some nice, you know, uh, elementary school level arithmetic. And it moves one phosphate to another. So then you get one ATP and you get one AMP. Okay. So it's like a, it's like a trick your muscles can use to quickly regenerate a little ATP for intense activity. And you're left with AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So one phosphate. That's cool, right? This adenosine monophosphate can then trigger this pathway called AMP kinase. So a lot of us have probably heard of that if you're into autophagy or a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of this enzyme. Basically, it's a nutrient sensor for the body. It's an energy sensor telling you you don't have a lot of energy on board. So this can get stimulated by exercise. The tricky thing with um, heavy glycolytic activity is you induce a certain level of acidosis within the muscle that can actually deaminate AMP. It can actually destroy it. And this has to be, uh, you then have to, you know, recycle the adenosine. You have to go through all these cellular processes to basically, you know, recover from that. But this is sometimes why you can create so much extra damage with some heavy, like, hit training and whatnot. And this is why I become more curious if and this is something I want to dive more into is, but because I feel like we're seeing insulin resistance improve better with some of these mafetone zone two cardio. And it might be mm -hmm. because we're able to generate AMP, but without this persistent acidotic state that's destroying it in the process. Yeah. And therefore you've got more glute for glucose uptake without having to hammer it with insulin all the time. So not only is insulin not hammering glucose into your cells and you've reduced your body fat, which is yeah. not so the insulin is not holding the, 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 the energy back in your cells. You're actually sucking it up through exercise without the need for insulin. So your insulin requirements just plummeting. And yeah, Peter Atia and um, this guy was talking about the amount of, you know, if you get a type one endurance cyclist, the amount of insulin they need just plummets because they're just doing so much exercise and sucking up all the glucose through non insulin glucose metered uptake. Yeah, that's one half of it. Okay. And I, I think Peter oh, actually talked about Yeah. Okay. So yeah. one half is specifically the glucose uptake rel related to exercise. But what about just the general insulin sensitivity we see improved, right? Mm. So later on, people are more insulin sensitive. They're not exercising. Mm. Why? Right. So um, as we upregulate fat metabolism, this goes back to like, why is the insulin receptor, how does it become insulin resistant? I think for a while there's been this curiosity. We've known that it's been something related to sort of like fatty acid interaction with it, but it turns out what it, what it looks like biochemically. Maybe you heard this. Like it's a little. Mm. Want me to get that? But okay, can we get can we get into it? Yeah, do okay. it. All right. So 
Fat is typically, when it's in its storage form, it's called a triacylglycerol. It's three fatty acids hooked to a glycerol backbone. Glycerol is just like a, a sugar alcohol, essentially. Um, some Your body can cleave off some of these acyl units, and you can get a scenario where instead of a triglyceride, you have a diglyceride or a diacylglycerol. So you have two fats on a glycerol backbone. And this can infuse into the lipid bilayer, which is this, the, the layer outside the cell. It can actually sort of interact with the insulin receptor. It can bring up these things. They're called these novel uh, uh, um, novel kinases. They're called PK epsilon and PK theta in the muscle. In the liver, it's just called P, it's just PK epsilon. And what these things do is they essentially bind into certain slots within the insulin receptor, and they uh, reduce its sensitivity. Okay. These are diacylglycerols. These are fats. Mm. They're essentially a lipid membrane. And, you know, there's a lot to be said. Like, we have to dive a lot more to understand fully these things. But at the end of the day, you know, you do see people improve insulin sensitivity over time with this low-grade cardio. Um, it specifically upregulates fat metabolism. And, you know, I'm going to make a leap here, but kind of what, I, what I've been trying to try to put together, I don't know if there's direct studies on this yet, but this is kind of where looking at all of it, trying to piece it together. I think that this low-grade cardio, the sort of mapitone zone 2, whatever you want to call it, mm. is helping basically remove these diacylglycerols that are bound to these PK epsilon and PK thetas that are inhibiting ins the insulin receptor. It's very tough. It's I'm not sure how tightly they're bound if, and what kind of level of competitive inhibition it is and whatnot. That's a whole enzyme. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's an enzyme kinetics thing we don't want to get into. But basically, seems where, what I think it seems to be plausible is that I don't know how much resistance training is helping it. You know, I, I could. I'm still trying to ponder that when I have free time with <laughs> med school and residency. But it's. I think this lower grade cardio might be more effective at helping remove these like these right. acid glycerols and you know how tightly these bound is this for life you know but if you can remove those to improve the insulin receptor you're still improving it through exercise but then later on in a non-exercise state you might have mm. sensitivity mm. Mm. so through the fat burning low intensity you've got improvement of insulin sensitivity and then through the muscle building testosterone gain you've uh, got improvement of, of metabolic rate because you're actually holding more muscle, which burns more energy rather than having to continue to dial back the calories more and more and more and more to lose weight, which is never a sustainable place to be because you back yourself into a corner, low metabolic rate, eating 500 calories a day and, and you're miserable, cold and depressed and all of a sudden you're, you're binging yeah. on the donuts and, and face first in the cheesecake. Yeah. I think a lot of us have done that crash cardio thing before, crash diet cardio thing. And it works like a couple of times and then it doesn't. It's one of those yeah. things that works until it doesn't. And then you kind of like, yeah, you eventually end up in this, you know, lifting and then chill cardio. And then, you know, where does hit fall? It sounds like I'm very anti hit, the high intensity interval training, but um, that's something you use to peak for sports. So for people who are actually curious, it's like the eight weeks, four to eight weeks before a sport. That's when you train that main, it adapts very quickly and you peak mm. for a sport. You finish your event, whatever you're doing, and then you go back to the alternation. And then mm. we could talk about block periodization if we really want to go specifics, or we could talk specifics about the cardio. But maybe yeah. I don't know. I've already been talking for like over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so next question we come up with um, is a lot of people find when when they start data driven fasting, their blood sugars come down and down and down and down, and they're sort of bottom out and stabilize at a very very low level and all of a sudden their their trigger is you know 50 or 60 milligrams per deciliter but sometimes at that point you know that their blood sugar is really low but they're not continuing to lose weight is there a point where um you know a carb bolus occasionally will help boost the metabolism boost the thyroid we've talked a little bit about this with metabolic flexibility and um yeah you know, it's funny you mention that because I, you know, sometimes I'm a bad lurker. I try to help on the forums, but sometimes I'm actually picking out the interesting cases. Some of the people I'm I'm writing down because I'm waiting to, because I want to talk to them individually and see, okay, how are things going? And I want to see what they're doing. There's like a few different people who have different like uh, responses that I'm actually kind of following more. Yep. These are, I would call these like the atypical people and they're the most interesting, right? I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah data-driven fasting works really, really well for most people. And you know, as the blood sugars come down, the waist and weight, everything sort of falls into place. But there's some people that seem to, I don't know whether the metabolism slows, like you talked about, your thyroid slows, your whatever happens yeah. and the body adapts to that lower. Some people have done extended fasting before and they come into the whole process and are quite um, lethargic to, to start with. So, yeah, what, what is there a role for uh, – most of them come from a keto background, which is very – low carb so is there a, a place for a bit of a carb spike occasionally at that point yeah and so i want to like yeah so i'm going to talk about this and it, it's got potentially one realm that's maybe a little non-ideal so we'll kind of talk about it but um so the thyroid has a half-life of like five days okay um people don't know half-life you have to click five days for half of it to, to, to reduce so um, if you play with like, I, I noticed that for myself, if I go too low calorie, you know, it feels okay for a few days and all of a sudden mm. it hits you. Mm. <laughs> and it, it kind of correlates around that time. You're like, Oh, I need to eat something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so someone's fasting and then they're they start to get, you know, these sort of like hypothyroidist symptoms, like they're feeling cold all the time. And, and I've actually had that in the past, like, you know, dieting too much and, you know, having cold intolerance where like, you know, friends are at a pool party and it's like warm outside. But if I got in the pool, I would like die because I'm so cold. So it's a life of overtraining in jujitsu. But anyways, um, so yeah, so 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 why are we fasting? Like, why, why not just count calories? Why do this fasting thing? You know, a lot of it, I would argue, when I talk to people about it, is you know we're trying to basically reduce insulin levels so that when they do come up, we're more sensitive to them. That's the general like when our mm. hormones high all the time, we reduce our sensitivity to it, right? We kiss a lot of drugs, and like you know, you look at like people taking like nitro for heart related stuff. Like the body, and sometimes you, you have to like try to peak these things. Like mm. a lot of hormones do better with peaks and then drop, so you yeah. always remain sensitive to it. Mm. Um, so with that said, that's a lot of times my argument for like I'm not against insulin. You know, it's why I kind of move around, move against the insulin hypothesis. I'm like kind of a cool hormone. We just yeah. don't want high all the time. You yeah, know. Yeah. So getting these like little insulin peaks can be cool. So when we do a, like a caloric bolus and we get an insulin peak and, you know, um, we do shove some energy into fat cells and, you know, and when you do this, when, when you do this appropriately, we can talk about like a lot of having a lot of fat cells, having, this is having big swollen ones and subcutaneous versus visceral fat. But generally speaking, when you do this insulin spike and shove a lot of energy in them quickly, you get like a concomitant leptin spike. So why do we care about leptin, right? So leptin is an energy signaling molecule, and it's more long-term as opposed to some short-term one. So um, it, you can kind of transiently increase it from a big refeed. And, and you know, first and foremost is protein. This is the most thermogenic. You're only thinking when we're thinking about thermogenesis, we're thinking about thyroid. The protein is the most thermogenic. So that's number one. Mm. Right? So you have to hit your protein goals to help maintain your metabolism. I think that's just an absolute flat out. You have to do that. Following that, though, when you compare carbs and fat, We'll skip alcohol because I don't. Want, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when you compare carbs and fat, um, fat doesn't actually have that much of a thermogenic effect. Interestingly, mm. carbs do. Um, you know, we do see. It seems like over time, though, when people are you know chronically taking a lot of carbs, they don't get the same thermogenic spike from it. And and this is another thing. When you when you fast and then eat, that first meal has the biggest thermogenic effect, which is one mm. reason I think the, the whole six meal day thing is crap. Because they're like, yeah, they're trying to argue that, okay, like, yeah, you're, you're, you're increasing thermogenesis by eating six meals a day, but you get the largest thermogenic effect by going from no eating to eating. That first mm. meal has the biggest thermogenic effect. Yeah. So, like, that's where you want to get your bang for your buck. And then you do this carbohydrate spike, um, and, you know, and I want to talk about a problem with that, which we need to address, but you know, it has to do with physiological insulin resistance. Because I'm not going to say this out, you know, someone's going to hold my toes to the fire. So we'll talk about it. But, um, so we do this carbohydrate spike, we get a leptin spike, and this leptin spike will then interact with the arcuate nucleus on the hypothalamus, which then triggers hypothalamic hormones, which are like DNRH, which is an adrenaline releasing hormone, which then goes to the pituitary, and it's going to help you get your testosterone and all your cool stuff. You get your TRH, which is the TSH and thyroid, and then all these other cool hormones. But basically where I'm going with this is you want a leptin spike to basically reignite your hypothalamus, then go through this whole pathway, right? Now, the tricky thing is when 
this one's high all the time. After Robert Lustig, if you look at his work, he's a endocrinologist. Mm. I think out of UCSF, but he showed mm. that yeah, chronic elevated insulin uh, inhibits the it basically causes resistance to leptin at the level of the arcuate nucleus in the hypothalamus. So that's another reason to deplete insulin over time, so you don't induce this resistance. Mm. And what's cool is he actually showed this by giving a drug called octreotide. So octreotide, it's also called somatostatin essentially, but basically it shuts off a lot of hormones. But he would give it to these people with hypothalamic disorders with leptin resistance, shut off their insulin essentially. And then he did the coolest graph, one of the coolest graphs I've ever seen in my life, where he plotted units of leptin, I think on the y-axis and the bottom was thermogenesis. In other words, he measured per unit yeah. of leptin, the efficiency of thermogenesis, right? But an ideal scenario wouldn't take much leptin to cause a lot of thermogenesis. And what he showed was that in these patients, when you knocked out insulin with octreotide, you increased the effectiveness of leptin to act on the hypothalamus. In other words, mm. per a leptin, you got more thermogenesis. And this is another reason I was a fan of fasting. I'm like, okay, let's mm. eat insulin make the hypothalamus more insulin center more leptin sensitive through that by keeping insulin high yeah we spike insulin to get leptin to spike but it's not chronically high we're not in mm. so i don't know if that makes sense but so you have something to say yeah no no go go so, so at that point you get really depleted your insulin levels are low your blood sugar levels are low and hunger can be quite intense at that point is there a point where just you know we i think you talked about this chart from the satiety article where we um we look at you know from a satiety point of view it's really hard to overeat those you know yeah. rice broccoli potato if, if you jump to the other end a lot of people do the carb cycling where you you'll deplete glucose you'll deplete insulin but to eat, your thyroid tends to down regulate you get depleted you get tired and and then maybe a, a carb bolus at the other end, as long as you're avoiding this middle ground, that danger zone of carb plus fat, you're probably in a good place if you just have a brief spike, reset leptin, boost your thyroid. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Exactly. I think the biggest thing people screwed up in the past with that was, yeah, you don't want to eat fat when you do this spike. Because you're going to, you know, so fat metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, metabolism sort of oppose each other to an extent, right? I mean, as mm. you get this, increase in triglycerides and free fatty acids from the fat, this will lead to that diacylglycerol and pit leading to insulin resistance at the receptor. You're having mm. this scenario, you have both fat and carbs at the same time and they're impeding each other. Mm. And a funny segue, like one of the problems with fructose is you have a you have a carbohydrate and it goes to the liver and essentially comes out mm. as fat. You have a yeah. carbohydrate that induces the same state where you basically have carb and fat metabolism at the same time, right? So like it's basically a donut. Yeah, yeah being produced in the liver because you get the carb and the fat together yeah fructose is wild i don't want to rip on it entirely i think it's got some interesting uses but like yeah everything's a tool but it's yeah fructose is wild but, <laughs> when, but, when you need to overfuel for yeah. high energy high performance events yeah but anyways um so yeah doing this carbohydrate spike and making sure you keep fat low so you don't like impede you know you don't just create this horrible insulin resistant state can be beneficial the problem, though, is this physiological insulin resistance. So if you've been, you know, they, they've shown this. I, I was reading this study a long time ago with these, the, like, young college athletes. or I can't remember if they were athletes, but they were young. But they had them do, like, a three-day fast. So three days. These are not diabetic people, and they're fasting for three days. And then they gave them a carb bolus, and they uh, actually, you know, had, like, relatively high blood glucose spikes, you know, how damaging was it? You know, you, you know, you could talk about it, but basically, like the, the body will start to kind of like figure it out. But you know, during fasting, your body creates physiological insulin resistance, which we need to explain that. I don't know. Basically, yeah, Matt, Matt, yeah you, you explain your understanding of it. I think it's a, there's a lot of different understand uh, yeah, interpretations of what it is. Yeah, we got to make sure your but when during starvation there's a few cells in your body that don't have mitochondria and so if a cell doesn't really have mitochondria it can't use fat as a fuel so there's like mm. your red blood cells they don't have mitochondria and then like you know like your astrocytes or the glia sorry i have to review it sometimes but certain brain cells i think it's the astrocytes but um some of them don't have mitochondria so we have to make sure that they essentially get glucose so your body tries to shuttle glucose to those cells that need it and then at the same time uh, a lot of cells that don't necessarily need it that can run on fat will become this transient insulin resistant state 
which ties back into that uh, that PK epsilon diacylglycerol pathway. Because basically, mm -hmm. what that is is that is that's the same pathway for physiologic information. Well, that's what they think. We don't know. Mm -hmm. they, they go for that. But, um, but yeah, so. So when someone does a carb spike, so going back to your question, trying to spike the thyroid, if they do a carb spike, they've been potentially in a physiological insulin resistant state, they potentially get like a really high blood sugar spike. Mm. You know, maybe not diabetic level, but let's say it was like a 160 or 170 in a young, healthy person. You might say, if you're in the medical field, you're like, ah, 160, 170, that's not that big of a deal. But let's be nitpicky, right? We want to be optimizing our nutrition and health, right? Anytime your blood sugar raises above 140, it starts glycating, you know, nerves and stuff more than we really want it to. Like mm. to extent. And this so might you definitely be don't, you don't want to live there all the time. You don't want to be elevated all the time, but the occasional excursion for somebody who's trying to, you know, is it a yeah. good thing? Well, so, so here's the thing. So, um, this is one reason why I was like, I don't always normally talk about this. I like to play with things myself for a while, but I was on endocrine this month, right? And I got access to CGM. So I was like, hey, <laughs> you know, can you I play with it? it? Yeah. So we could talk about CGMs. What are your recommendations? I think most people doing DDF and stuff should just rely on the blood glucometer. It's better. When should a, when could a CGM be beneficial? I would take two scenarios. One, when you are trying to figure out these post-exercise blood sugars. Mm. You can catch a lot of weird stuff going on with your blood sugar after workouts that it's it'd be almost too hard to catch with a with a glucometer. Yep, 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 There's yep. so much going wild. That's the one time a CGM could be nice. But again, CGMs are continuous blood glucose monitor, CGM, continuous mm. glucose monitor. Um these things are very expensive, so it's like not always applicable. But the other scenario is it's kind of like brought in line with Rob Wolf's wire to eat protocol of testing different foods. Um mm. I like it because I catch, I have a lot of foods I cannot eat, do a lot of gut issues. And it's funny, I can, if I accidentally get them, I can see these, these transient blood sugar spikes that are pretty bad looking. For example, like tomatoes and peppers, I do terrible with certain nightshades. Yeah, wow. yeah. And, you know, the other week I, I had some because my birthday, I was like, screw it, I want, I want some, you know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you went wild on tomatoes for your birthday. Yeah. 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 The next day, my blood sugar was just screwed up for a while, and I felt wow. my face was all inflamed. And I get I get nightmares from them. That's like really weird, but I don't know. But whatever. Crazy. Yeah. So, anyways, the cool thing with the CGMs is I've been able to use that and play with this more. So I'm like, all right, let's let's try messing around with this blood sugar spike and see um, if we can mitigate it. So where I've been with that, what I, th I think there actually might be a way to mitigate it and not get such an awful blood sugar spike. I think it's in line with a lot of our other DDF stuff, but basically mm. getting an earlier protein feeding. Mm. I think if you get a protein feeding a few hours earlier, it seems to, seems to maybe, I guess when I'm looking at my own numbers, you know, I, I'm trying to dig and see if I can find a paper that maybe agrees with me, which you know, confirmation bias never, 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 never hurt anyone. Right. But, um, but, no, I think, I think, yeah. So, cause the problem is this physiological insulin resistance from prolonged fasting, right? Um, so if we do a protein feeding, we can sort of potentially get a little bit of some of these hormonal spikes without getting a horrible blood sugar spike. Mm. And basically mm. kind of tell our body like, Hey, we're not quite in a fasting state, but that it can kind of re reduce some of this physiological insulin resistance and then follow that later with the carb spike. And I'm seeing much better blood sugars from that approach. So you might have a, a, a typically low carb few days and then come back with a, a high carb occasionally yeah so how often do you tend to do that so yeah. um if i if things recently i've been doing a lot of jiu-jitsu i'm trying to get it in and I'm lifting a lot so i'm just having to eat a lot more than i normally do but let's say i was back in a state where i was just working out once every three days i was really busy and just trying to lean out i find when i'm really busy that's a good time to lean out because it's like you just fast <laughs> don't have right? time to eat so um i would probably do I, I the simplest thing is to just do my carb bolus like you know with the workout days and then so you could just do like the bolus on the workout day and then do two hypocaloric days afterwards mm -hmm. i would work out once every three days but you can prolong it and part of this too is really how big are you if you're big you don't really need to do this if you have a lot of weight to lose there's a lot of energy on board the refeed is not really necessary 
It's really as you're leaning out, you're going to start bumping into this issue. And mm. a good way to know this, a good way to like kind of like predict it is your post-workout blood sugars from what I found. Um, mm. So uh, by when I was larger, my post-blood sugar, my post-workout blood sugars would say very elevated for almost four hours afterwards. And I wouldn't even eat after workouts. I actually eat most of my calories pre-workout. We can talk about that. But, mm. um, but as I leaned out a lot, at about the two-hour mark, my blood sugar would tank way below my trigger sometimes. You know, so and it would be it would be elevated for about two hours, and then it was a rapid drop. And I got my testing lot. I could feel when it happened. You know, you and, and then you get super hungry and just want to eat whatever. Yeah. So yeah. at that point, you probably will want to go. What once your blood sugar tanks, you want to maybe go for the carbs at that point to rescue it from tanking after the big workout? Potentially. Yeah. And, um, and I want to say this too, cause I always talk about, you know, everything's a tool and I always feel like the wrong population gets the information. So I want to clarify that. Like this is a, this is a tool when you're leaner, when you're lar- mm. like, I, I've, I've talked to people in the past and I've back when in my dietitian days, I remember like one guy specifically, I, he just liked to ask me a lot of questions. So I talked about refeeding stuff. And then he came back the next time. He's like, oh, I did a refeed. I was like, oh, what was your workout? He was like, yeah, I like vacuum and stuff. And I'm like, what are you? No. Like, Dude. <laughs> and he was kind of larger. And I'm like, that's why sometimes I get nervous talking because I don't like to – I try to be careful about telling information to the, per- the wrong person, right? Mm. But it's like this is a strategy for when you're leaner. But mm. if you're larger, it's really not that necessary to play with this. Yeah. I suppose that might be a good segue to the, the metabolic flexibility aspect. And my understanding of metabolic flexibility is basically the ability to burn fat or carbs alternately and, and even at the same time. And what's happening when we're, like you're talking about, if, if you're more overweight, if all your, your stores are full, your blood glucose is full, your liver, liver, out, liver and muscle are full, your fatty acids in your bloodstream are full and your adipose tissue is full, um, you, you're going to be because of oxidative priority, always burning glucose. Your RQ is going to be high, and therefore you're going to be oxidizing glucose. So you're basically stuck in glucose mode. Although you've got this fat stored, you never get to the fat because you've got the the glucose stored. So then we use DDF to deplete the blood glucose, and that allows the basically the fatty acids to to flow back into uh, to be used, and then then eventually your body fat to be depleted and at that point you're metabolically flexible to some extent because you can burn fat or you can store fat or carbs because you've you've depleted your fuel tanks for those and and when they come in there's a place to store them and you're not always burning the carbohydrate which is just first in line to be burnt so but to some degree you get to a point where uh, you're not going to burn the carbs well if you haven't seen them for you haven't eaten a carb for three months because you can become really fat adapted and vice versa when you switch. So um, how do you achieve metabolic flexibility? What is it? A lot of people talk about it. Um, what's your take on the whole thing? So yeah, so I think the person though we would like we would worry about like like why do we care about this? Um, the person. I, I've noticed some people have this issue recently where they, uh, someone actually posted it recently, but they are having these elevated blood sugars throughout the day while they're fasting, not elevated, just, just slightly elevated. And it looks like a pattern of like the physiological insulin resistance. So like have these times where they work out and they, they do I'm not fully sure their workouts, but they'll kind of get down a little bit lower then, but they're, they're kind of persistently hanging around like a 106, 106, 106 or 110 blood sugar which isn't terrible but it's like they've leaned out they've been keto for a long time they're very much in this like fat adapted state but then it's odd right their blood sugar just kind of maintains this persistent like 106 or something Mm. is that bad it's hard to say because it's like you know i don't really know if we have that many papers that have followed people for decades to see if it's really that bad so it's kind of debatable right but but let's say we want to let's say we're gonna just say okay we don't like this how do we fix it so um, you know, one, you know, one quick thing is I, I do think playing, playing with the numbers, I think it goes back to that sort of, in, that sort of, uh, diacylglycerol sort of interaction with the PK epsilon at the insulin receptor. Like basically when you're in this persistently, uh, fasting state, like that is the adaptation. It, it appears that causes the physiological insulin resistance. 
what I'm thinking is that maybe people just have accumulated this over time by being low carbon keto for a while. But like, how do you fix that? Like, I'm not necessarily saying people. I'm not necessarily saying that people need to abandon keto or something, but this is what I want people to play with. Because I actually, this is the one of those things I was saying. Like, I don't like to recommend things till I play with it. Mm. But this is where I want someone to do a serious, like, mafetone zone two cardio thing, like we were talking about earlier. Like, I want to see if they could. That is one of the few things that most likely can get can help cleave that to try to remove some of that glycerol buildup, so like by regulating that fat. So. Maybe stay away from the weights and the high intensity cardio. I mean, you can do a little weights here and there, but really, I'm a fan of block periodization, which we didn't talk about. But just give a solid two to three months of really trying to adapt that sort of fat milling, that um, burning engine from the exercise perspective of just like uh, really keeping it low grade and, and seeing if that can correct it. The other piece is actually doing the protein feeding early in the day. I think that's another thing that helps. Mm. Uh, it, I've been playing with my own numbers for, for a while with that when I do when I do have these transient elevated numbers. And that's another thing. I like that's one reason I said my argument before about taking in the protein before the carb feeding. It does seem like protein can help get you out of this physiological insulin resistance state a little bit by dropping your blood sugar. And then now you kind of prime yourself so you're not gonna have such a high blood sugar spike if you take it in carbs. And I actually follow that pattern sometimes. I have things mm. I follow that pattern, but I've actually like seen this and been kind of messing with it. Yeah. So you might lead with a high protein meal, then at night after a big workout, you'll have a, a high carb meal yeah, after yeah. your high protein meal. Yeah. But for those who are, I guess to answer your question about the metabolic flexibility, it's like, it's like reframe it basically. Who's someone that seems like they're not, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. We, we've, we've developed someone who can use fat as a fuel by putting them keto and fasting and everything. But then we get this odd state where we've done it for a long time. And now like, it's like, are we becoming carbon intolerant? I mm. guess that's kind of where I'm going, right? And, so, and is that a problem in a big way? Yeah. And it's like, if when you does that really become eat, a problem? Yeah. If you never eat carbs, does not matter, right? You know, and that's mm. what I'm saying. Like if we followed them long term, is it a problem? But let's say it is a problem. Let's like, let's philosophically jump to that. I would say that that person trying the math term thing might make more sense. And it's funny too, because from an exercise perspective, like if you're eating more carbs, that kind of goes hand in hand with a glycolytic activity. But if you're doing more keto, I mean, we know that that from a sports perspective, sports perspective makes more sense for endurance training. For doing this low grade exercise would go better with that salad diet anyway. But mm. so, yeah. So if someone is a, is a sugar burner bad at using fat, we do this combination of like, fasting, low carb and whatever workout, and we kind of improve the use of fat as a fuel. But then if it's a weird state we're seeing now where it's like someone's like, are they not using carbs well as a fuel now? And this is something I feel like hasn't really been tapped into, but that's kind of where I'm going. With this. Mm. Yeah. And potentially most of the time you could do the, the, the low carb protein focused um, training, low intensity, and then maybe backload the carbs when you need to after the high intensity or when you need to prepare for a major event, you can fuel however you want just to get the energy in there to do what you need to do. And hopefully your body knows what to do with it when that comes along. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people worry about slowing their metabolism when, when fasting or, or long-term energy restriction and basically anything you do will, as you talked about before with the, uh, um, long distance runners, they'll find a way of adapting. Your body will adapt to a lower energy intake. How do you, how do you mitigate that? Is that basically, we talked about protein resistance training, keep your testosterone up, keep your muscle mass up. And that's why with DDF, we definitely prioritize the adequate protein to maintain lean mass. And I think that's one critical aspect that we struggle with a lot in fasting. Again, if everybody's afraid of, you know, mTOR and IGF-1 and insulin, therefore avoiding protein completely. Well, I had podcasts with Dave Asprey. I haven't listened to him for a couple of years, but he's um, drinking bulletproof coffee and then having 150 supplements a day. It's like, dude, you know, get your protein, get your nutrients from your food, and then you yeah. don't need this massive expense of, uh, uh, of biohacking yeah. supplements. So... I mean, I love me a good old biochem paper, right? It's a good, it's always fun to do, to go into rabbit holes. And so people start talking in tour and autophagy. It, it's fun. The one thing I feel like people always skip is tissue. What tissue are we talking about? Are we talking about mTOR in the brain? 
in the ki- in the kidney, in the muscle. Intel, so like, intel, intel is bad. Yeah, yeah. Things are tissue specific, and I feel like that's what people ignore. Like, what's interesting about exercise is that there are different isoforms of, for example, like AMP kinase and stuff. And typically, we think of like when you're fasting, you're stimulating this AMP kinase, and when you're eating, you're doing mTOR. But like, you know, during during certain types of training, you can actually stimulate mTOR specifically in the muscle while upregulating AMP kinase in the fat. And it's a different isoform. There's different isoforms of AMP kinase between fasting and, and working out, and that's how you mm. can do this. But like, that's the thing. It's like, it's not like your body is always in mTOR and always in AMP kinase, like always in this fasting autophagy state. Like, these things can be tissue specific. And the mm. holy grail, of course, is everyone wants to be jacked with no fat, right? So everyone wants to, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I mean, it's the holy grail. Like, so, so. That's what we're all striving for, Clark. Hell yeah. That's what's up. That's what <laughs> this stuff is for. Yeah. <laughs> You're closer than me. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So it's like we want mTOR in the muscles and we want, you know, autophagy or, or you know, AP kinase stimulation in the fat, right? That's kind of like the, the you know, the beat, what we're looking for. But then, you know, we also have to talk about the liver and everything. But, so with all that said, um, shit, I had a total direction I was going to go with this, and I completely lost my answer. <laughs> well, which, which, which tissue is it in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a, my thought. Of, it's probably in my, like, I don't know, my, like some fascia <laughs> between my knees or something, my perinephric gutter, hot <laughs> gutter or something. You know. um, yeah, sorry. I, yeah. I'll remember it. Uh, often a tangent there of being um, backwards and forwards with um, – uh, Rabenheimer and Simpson, who wrote the protein leverage paper, and they did this um, some of the most fascinating work on protein leverage and how uh, you know we have a protein percentage that we need to hit, and then our appetite stabilizes. But at the same time, they did this massive mouse study where they found that uh, I don't see a lot of significance in the data, like that that the change up and down is quite small. But they said, you know lower protein and higher carb there's better for longevity in these rats in a cage and it's interesting it's like well how, if that's true at that end how do you find the balance between having enough strength and leanness that comes from having a- adequate protein and adequate satiety and how do you balance that with the negative side effects of you know i'm going to be frail i'm going to fall over i'm, I'm going to get heart disease because I'm fat and, and, and then if maybe there are some longevity from excess overstimulation of mTOR and I think that's probably the next frontier of aging is you know how do you find that balance point between excess mTOR stimulation versus you know being lean jacked strong and, and being able to wipe your bum for as long as possible <laughs> um, and not being in a, a nursing home for 10 years or living a decrepit life that you got yeah. other people feeding a crap food all the time and not enjoying that yeah, I mean, I think it's, as I said before, I think tissue specificity is important. Like, yeah, we want mTOR in our muscles, right? Because when you go into old age, on the one hand, you, we see some things that correlate with old age, but also going into old age with, with a lot of muscle mass does help longevity, typically if it's like around the hips, I think. Mm. Um, but, you know, in, uh, so yeah, I think leg muscle mass tends to be the bigger correlator, um, which another reason you should squat. But, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but anyways, you know I think I think tissue specificity is important. I mean, even like the in the past, you know, they looked at dinitrophy and all of the uncoupler that made people lose weight, and one of the problems with it is it affected the entire body. But now they're doing these studies on these uncouplers that just go in the liver, and they're actually looking like they're pretty amazing for mitigating, uh, you know, uh, hepatic steatosis, like fatty liver, essentially. So I don't know. I think I think that's one piece that's missing is that people. Sometimes when they talk biochem pathways, they're not talking about which tissue, and that always bugs me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Um, another question that comes up is, you know, once you get insulin sensitive, you get leaner, um, or as you get to reverse that, when you become leaner, you become more insulin sensitive, and effectively your body wants to hold on to energy more easily. How, you know, if you get to that point, your blood sugars are low, but you still got more body fat, you, you body's just good at storing fat even though you're probably metabolically at a low risk because your blood sugars are in a good place what can you do to continue that journey is there anything other than just you know lots of slow walking low intensity walking getting nutrient dense feeding adequate protein etc good sleep 
Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, we gotta, we always gotta jump back. It's like the four pillars model, right? So we have the exercise and sleep. Those are two pillars everyone, I mean, I mean exercise and diet. Those are the two pillars mm. everyone focuses on. And everyone ignores sleep and community. I, yeah. I said community instead of stress because your, your community is, right? When you, when you, when you do this whole extrapolation of like community effects and endorphins and opioid addiction and, and cortisol levels, you see this big correlation there. The best, I don't know, long story short, Sleep and community have massive impacts. Mm. You, know, you look at the blue zones, the places where you have these centenarians living long, and it seems that an exercise play a part of the impact on how long they live, but it seems to be the community aspect that has the yeah. largest impact on how yeah, long yeah, they live. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, I always take a step back first, and it's like, are we missing some of the big stuff, like the sleep and, yeah, the sleep and community, which most people probably are. I'm terrible at sleep. But then, I mean, <laughs> like, Me too, but I, yeah. I, I, I try. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, lot to be done in life. Yeah, I've been going on rabbit holes with, you know, the near infrared spectra with light therapy and this whole nitric oxide production. It's been my project recently, though, and that ties into that. But I don't know. So maybe I'll have some comments in the future that would sleep. But, um, but yeah, no, I would fall. I would start there. Actually, first go back and make sure community and sleep is tightened up. Yeah. Then after that, it's really working with the person. You know, it's like. A lot of times I say to people, like, people aren't snowflakes until they are. Like, in the beginning, you just yeah. treat them like, they're, yeah, they're, they're not a snowflake. Just do the DDF program or something or whatever program works for them. Just do it. And then after a while, if they hit that point like you're talking about, then it takes, like, a little more fine-tuning. So, like, I would say you're not a snowflake until you are. I don't know. So, yeah. and, and what are the most common snowflake symptoms? What do people present with and, and how do you solve them? That's probably a massive rabbit hole for another two hours. But Yeah. It hits that point where it's almost like, yeah, I need to go in more in depth. Like, I don't know, like like this month, it's like, ah, no, nah, I'm going to talk too much. But I think we're at the hour and a half mark. Do we want to keep going or call it? Or what <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we can save that the, the snowflake discussion for another one. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so um, the, the, the four pillars are probably your biggest tips of uh, what you need to do and, and how you need to manage. Yeah. The, the, the way you would start. So, um, what are your hopes for the future? Where do you want to? Where do you want to take all this? And where do you hope people will go in nutrition and metabolism and exercise? My biggest aspiration is to be a snowflake. No. <laughs> <laughs> a really jacked and lean snowflake. Yeah, yes, yes, snowflake for life. Um, I think I took notes because I think I saw you. There was a thought about that, and I was like, oh man, I don't know. Um, yeah, so a couple of things I hope for the future, like, I don't know, um, it's interesting going from the dietetics world and then this sort of like, I don't know what you call our world. This, I, originally it was the paleo world, the ancestral health world, the optimization world, whatever you call it. Like, and then we have the med, the typical medical world. And each one is just, I, I feel like I'm in this spot where I'm like trying to bring it together, right? That's why I'm interested, we talked earlier about the SGLT2s and the GLP1s. Mm. I'm like, mm. trying to find that gap to where like someone's, a horrible medical state where they're on all this insulin and i want to get them to this sort of four pillars model of health and there's just mm. like nothing in the middle sometimes mm. so it's like and, and some people are like you know screw medications like you know they're bad for you and i'm kind of like well they're kind of gonna like actually die if they, we take them like right off so like we need like something in the middle so i'd like that's been my aspiration is to like to bridge the gap between the two yeah, if, be like, hey, there is a middle gap, and then like maybe bring other people over there, and I don't know. And it's been a fascinating experience in med school, understanding like why, why, why it's been this way. You know, and that's another discussion. Um, yeah. My other big, my other big uh, hope in the nutrition world. This is odd, but just the sodium thing. Just like, let's, yeah, salt's not as bad as we made it out to be, and this is like, that's the, I don't know. I just want things to flip there. In, yeah. <laughs> there's still a lot of debate about that and you know but yeah. how do you how do you re remove the confounder of processed food because salt is just in all the processed food yeah yeah but i really loved uh some of the graphs you've shown with the satiety and you know mm. and you know the thing i love more than anything was just this sort of prioritization of like after protein for satiety the next mm. is you know minerals but more specifically electrolytes is what it looks yeah. like yeah definitely definitely that graph was actually out of everything that had 
I felt like that was a, one of the most profound things that I had seen out of everything you put out. I was like, huh. And then I immediately thought about it. I was like, that almost makes too much sense. Yeah, after protein okay. electrolytes are absolutely the most critical for you'll die. Like, like <laughs> so yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah, so there's a post on um sodium satiety. Definitely see um uh yeah, basically as you need you need enough sodium but once you get to a point where you've got enough sodium in your diet your appetite goes in search for other things like potassium and magnesium and that's why you can't just supplement everything you need whole food and that's why we promote whole food which drives greater satiety from the nutrient density yeah you know i'll, I'll plug in real quick but you know looking at rob wolf stuff with element and, and louis but you know they, mm. they've seen you know, people who get stuck a lot of times with their diet, something's not clicking. Sometimes it really just is the electrolyte piece afterwards they get out in their macros, but they're just, and I actually, I've even seen this for myself recently. I actually ramped up my potassium intake dramatically and yeah. it has had just a night and day effect on me. Um, mostly on my sleep. My sleep has gotten oh, really? profoundly better by ramping up my potassium intake. So just, yeah, potassium is probably one of the most, deficient nutrients in the whole food yeah. system because nobody's eating anything green and fresh anymore yeah. yeah i it's a funny thing the reason i stayed away from it for a little bit was because of my ulcer and also i used to use a uh i didn't really talk but yeah i play with ketone esters i play with ketone salts i don't they're again they're a tool they have a very specific use i could talk about but yeah. one of them was a, a beta hydroxybutyrate potassium one and yep Potassium can potentially irritate your gut and lead to ulcers. Mm. So that was one of the myriad of things I'd use at the time. And I was like, okay, well, is that why I got an ulcer? Yeah. I'd actually stayed away from a lot of excessive potassium for a long time because of that. But mm. I was fiddling recently. And then um, I happened to eat one thing that had a lot of potassium and I felt a lot better. And I was like, huh, was it the potassium? And I was like, oh, let's try, right? You know, let's give it, let's, let's risk an ulcer, you know? <laughs> Not cool, like cool. In your bowel, the lake you up in the morning. But, um, yeah. And now yeah, you've no, been chasing all your micronutrients with nutrient optimized for the challenge and trying to dial that in, which is a whole new challenge and a, probably another whole another podcast chat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I think that's most, those are too big. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks so much, Clark. It's been a whole lot of fun diving really deep in all the, 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 the mechanisms of everything. And um, thanks for being part of the community and, and jumping into the lives and nerding out and guiding people when they get stuck and helping the little snowflakes um, that yeah. don't just work with, you know, wait for your blood sugar to drop and then eat nutrient-dense protein, which works for most yeah. people. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I get excited because like, that's where you learn some stuff. So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you do the program and you wait for the weird stuff to go and you go, oh, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> yeah, dive in and help. And that's where people need uh, really smart, nerdy uh, doctors and endocrinologists who understand not just the, the medical aspects and the sick care, but actually, you know, healthcare and helping people optimize and, and solve those really nerdy problems. So thank you so much. It's been fun. We'll chat to you later. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. See you. Okay.